a very good evening to everyone. Thank you for making time uh, to uh, join us for the archive online talk. Raj uh, was my colleague in our history center and uh, we worked together uh, on this project for a couple of years. Uh, for me, it's a great learning experience and also I get to meet many friends from the Indian community. So he today, he will talk about uh, what he has learned uh, for the past three years, the voices from the Indian community, and he can talk about the evolving Indian family relationships, customs and celebrations, as well as businesses based on the oral history recordings of Singaporean Indians. So after the talk, then we will uh, do the Q&A. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me welcome Raj, please. Welcome to my home, because I'm doing this talk from home. And um, this talk was supposed to be in March, um, you know, and somehow if it was done in March, then we would all be in the same auditorium. I'll be looking at you, we can have eye contact, you know, you can even snarl at me if you didn't like whatever I said. Now, frankly, I can't see anyone. I can just look at myself and, um, you know, it's becoming a bit tiring just looking at myself. <laughs> now, coming back to, today's topic. Now, today's topic, I mean, you know, uh, the information today that I'm going to share today is basically uh, lifted from our oral history collection over the last three years. And uh, some of my own personal experiences as a Singaporean Indian who's uh, born and raised here. So it's from these two perspectives. Now, for the benefit of those people, uh, for the benefit of those people who have um, who are not familiar with oral history, um, can I uh, just uh, give you some definitions first? Okay. Now, if you look at these definitions, basically they are recordings of people's memories, what people saw, what people experienced, what people witnessed, how they felt, what they felt. So there, there are a lot of stories embedded in oral history. In fact, you know, once someone asked me, you know, what's the most interesting oral history that I've ever heard? But I think it's difficult to say because almost in every recording, there's something special, something very unique. So I would invite all of you to, you know, when you have time to come down to the National Archives, you know, at our website and listen to our recordings. You can do this in the comfort of your own home or in your office or when you're on the train. So there, there are a lot of rich stories uh, for you to listen to. Okay, so now, if you want to talk about evolving relationships, we must move back in time. Now, in this case, we will look at the parents of our Merdeka generation and younger members of our pioneer generation. That means people who are already in their 60s, maybe early 70s, we're not talking about them, we're talking about their parents. Their parents who came from India to Singapore when they arrived in the 1930s, 1940s, maybe in the 50s. Now, what shaped their family relationships? What shaped their parenting approaches? What shaped gender relations? What kind of beliefs they have? What were their social norms? What are their practices? That they migrated with. When people migrate, people don't just migrate physically, they also migrate together with their baggage, whatever their, their belief systems were. And um, in that sense, to understand this, we need to go back to India and we need to understand how diverse the Indian community is. Now, this is the map of India. So we have people migrating from the southernmost states of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, right up to Punjab up here. Now, this is a huge landmass. Look at the number of states here. Now, we're not just talking about states. We're talking about districts within these states, not just districts within these states. We are talking about small towns in this, within these districts. And we are talking about villages, thousands of villages that our forefathers came from. So we are talking about a lot of micro groups. Now, the Indian community is very diverse. Now, not just in terms of origins, in terms of language. People spoke a variety of languages from the southern tip to the north. And we also have another group of Tamil-speaking people 
who migrated from Sri Lanka. Now, and so their languages were so different. They spoke anything from Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, Punjabi, Gujarati, uh, Bhojpuri, you name. So there were so many languages. In terms of religion, we were also very diverse. So we have Hindus, we have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Sikhs, we have Jains. And if you look at the culture of India, I mean, you know, it's really rich. We have a variety of music, dance, drama, and so many things. So we are talking about a very, very diverse community that originated from thousands of villages and villages that were governed by the caste system. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the caste system. The caste system is basically a social stratification system based on occupational specialization. Originally, they spoke about four castes, the Brahmins, the priests, the Kshatriyas, who are basically warriors. I mean, you don't have to remember them, you just know what they did. And you're talking about the Sudras, and sorry, the Vaisyas were the business community, and the Sudras were artisans. But below this, there were hundreds of what you call as jihadi groups, which were, which were along uh, occupational specialization. That means you're talking about people who are priests, people who are laundry men, people who are barbers, people who, who provide funeral services, people who, you know, whole host of duties, porters and weavers and so on. So there are a lot of occupational based specialization. We call them the jadi groups. And well, each jadi group, uh, now let me add a bit more on the jadi groups. Huh? Now, it is the day a child is born, his life is prescribed from, for him. What job he will do, what, what will be his social status, who he can marry, and even what he can eat. For example, let's say if you are born as a Brahmin, then you would become a priest. So you will start learning the scriptures, you, you, know, you will be taught how to conduct uh, rituals, marriages, and so on. You will become very learned, you will learn more about religion, and you will live a very disciplined, a very prescribed life. No chicken curry for you, no fish curry for you, because you will be a strict vegetarian. The day a child is born, everything is prescribed for him. If let's say your father was a cobbler, then you probably have wider food choices. I mean, you pretty much can eat anything. You don't have to confine yourself to a vegetarian diet. You will learn how to repair shoes. You will do things like that. Likewise, if your father was a hairdresser, hairdresser those days, they don't do color surveys and reporting. So they call them barbers. So you learn how to snip hair, you learn how to shave. So this is what happens. Now, what well, every one of them provided a very valuable service for the common good of the village, you know, to keep the village functioning. Unfortunately, there was a hierarchy. Uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, there was a hierarchy, which is based on ritual purity or ritual pollution. Now, I, let me explain this. Let's say you were a Brahmin. You rank very high because you connect men to God. You live a very clean life. You're a vegetarian. And so you are ranked very high. You conduct rituals and so on. But if, let's say, if you're a barber, then you would, what you call as, uh, you, you deal with human waste. Hair is considered human waste. Or you deal with, you're a cobbler, you deal with cowhide and, 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 and things like that. So anyone who is dealing with the lower jobs, or if you're, if you're, if you're providing uh, funeral services, for example, you're a grave digger, or, you, or you, you handle cremation work. Now, these are considered as ritually impure. So this is how the division is. Of course, in the middle, it's not very clear cut. Now, um, when you are born into a particular jadi group, not only it, it determines what job you will do, you can only marry within your group. If you're a Brahmin, you will only marry a Brahmin. And inter-caste marriages are not allowed. And um, there's no occupational mobility. So your career is prescribed the day you're born. So it's a very, very fixed system that has gone on for thousands of years. Now, even, you know, you look at certain groups like the Sindhis, you know, who look very homogeneous. But I uh, understand from uh, Mr. Chatterbush that even in the Sindhi community, you have groups like Baibans, Amils, and Shikapuris. Baibans are business people, Amils are those professionals, and Shikapuris basically deal in money business. Even the Tamil Muslim community, they have the routers, 
That means their ancestors actually dealt in horse business. They, they, they imported horses and sold horses. And the Marakayas were basically mariners who, did, who were traders and in shipbuilders. And the Levis who were religious teachers. So you're talking about so many micro groups. That means people who came from small villages, there's so much diversity within them, there's so much differences. So you're talking about a very, very diverse. So everybody is broken into very small groups. And what do you do when you move into a new country like Singapore? You go along where your villagers stay, where your, your members of your caste stay. So there was a lot of, um, the residential patterns were largely determined by such things. So you have huge congregations, huge people, huge number of people living in say places like Jalankayu, Tanjumbaga, Naval Base. A lot of them were working for the British forces and there were a lot of kampungs they were living there. And some of them were also living in the workers' quarters, uh, you know, when they worked for the, for the public works department, public health department and so on. So what happens? Technically, the Indian village, not technically, the Indian village has been transformed to Singapore into different parts of Singapore. So within Jalanka, you, you might have several villages, you know, which were from India actually. And when people are in small groups, they come from the same place, they, they, they are kind of like prejudiced. They have to conform to social norms. When they migrated, they came here with the social customs and practices. So things like, you know, that, that in intercaste marriages, which is not allowed. So people were highly conscious of their personal and their family relations, uh, family reputation. I mean. Now, when you migrate, you, you came in search of a better life. So everybody wants to show that they are doing well. Then everybody is very careful about their family reputation. That means they want people to see that they are successful and they are also conformists. You know, they conform to the social norms. Now, with some information uh, provided by, you know, various history, various oral history recordings, we kind of like can construct a traditional Indian family. An Indian family where the husband was the head of the household and he was a financial provider. So he went to work, he earned money and he gave his money to the wife. Now, although the wife assumed a socially subordinate role, but I think the wives actually wield a lot of power. You know, whoever handles the purse string actually got a lot of power within the family, right? And these mothers were actually very amazingly resourceful. They man manage their money very carefully. Now you see them in the markets, they really drive hard bargains. They carefully buy their vegetables, their fish and chicken, and they were really, really bargain very hard. They will try to save as much as possible. Some of them will rear chickens on the side. And uh, Mr. Ram Janam said, who shared the story with me, his mom actually had a cow. You know, and, and the family's milk was milk supply was from the cow, and they were actually living. They, they are, his parents were actually what you call as jagas or watchmen. Now we call them security guards. They live within the premises of the factory. Outside the perimeter of the factory was state land, and their cow was actually housed there. And they even grew some vegetables. So it is this kind of a social setting we talk about. And the Indian mothers were very clever with money. They try to save as much and squirrel as much, you know, as savings as possible. And they will invest in gold jewelry. Why gold jewelry? First, gold jewelry can be given as bridal gift. Second, you know, you're talking about people who want to show that they are doing well. So if you're gold jewelry, you're wearing a nice thick necklace, you know, and you're, you're wearing gold, uh, you know, gold bangles and rings and, you know, and so on, and, you know, earrings and maybe no start sell. Now that means you're, you're doing very well, you know, you've got lots of gold, you know, so it's a way to show that you actually have arrived in life, you know, and there was also a practical purpose, especially for families who are not doing very well. See, whenever they run into a very tight situation, they need some quick cash, what they can do is they can just pawn this jewelry and then use the cash and try through that times. When times are better, they can redeem. 
But in between, if let's say there's a wedding, they will quickly redeem the jewelry, put on the jewelry, go for the wedding and say, oh, look, I'm doing fine, I'm doing well. Then after the wedding, they will put it back. So gold had a lot of practical value for the, for the Indian families. Now, you see, you're talking about microgroups here. Now, the Indian parents felt a very special responsibility for their daughters. Now, a lot of it is out of love for them, out of concern for their daughters. Then the Indian parents felt, you know, today when we educate our daughters, the minute they start working or when, when they finish their, their studies, we feel that we have almost completed our responsibilities. But those days, Indian parents felt that the ultimate responsibility, the most important responsibility, is to get their daughters married and keep them and set up a very happy marriage life for their daughters. So they're very, very protective. In fact, the relationship between the parents and daughter, daughters actually go beyond their marriage. You know, even during childbirth, those days, you know, the daughters used to come back to the mother's house. So it's a very, very special relationship. So Indian parents those days tend to be very protective of their daughters. Even not only protective about their physical welfare, more in terms of their reputation. Because if you are walking around, you know, the, there is room for a lot of gossip. You know, there are a lot of capos around. And, 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 and let's say if a girl is seen talking to a boy and somebody will say, ah, I saw so-and-so's daughter talking to this guy. There must be something going on, you know. And before the poor girl reaches home, probably her family will know about it. Probably half the village will know about it. You know, that's the kind of situation people look at each other. So Indian parents are very fearful of this. They say, look, I must protect my my daughter's job reputation. The best way is control her, control her movement. Now, this is not done with any punitive intention. It is actually the best of intention. Maybe for them, they felt this is the best way to show love to the children, to care. So they had a special responsibility and that's why they were, usually there were double standards within the family. The boys were given a bit more freedom and the girls had their all their freedom restrained. Now, romantic relationship, no, 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 not acceptable. Father um, and mother will decide who they will marry and they will marry someone within my caste. Now, if they don't marry within my caste, I lose face as a father. That's just a kind of feeling. Now, par parents were very conscious about the family prestige, you know, so, and they feel that the, the general norm was that it's good to have children who are very obedient, you know, and, and if someone manages to get his son or daughter married within his particular caste group, he could probably say, see, my children listen to me. I'm the boss, you know, they listen to me. And then, you know, you see, they married my own people. So he feels damn good about himself. You know, that's the kind of life people lived those days. And sons usually stayed with their parents after marriage. And, uh, you know, the... The role, you know, the, the degree of subordination between a husband and wife sometimes is difficult to define clearly because it varied with very families. Let me play a sound clip for you, uh, shared by Mr. Ram, Ram Jana, uh, who is from the Bojburi speaking community. The Bojburi speaking community are people who migrated from parts of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar in Northern India. The tradition in those days was when the husband eats, he eats first with his children. And my father would have, my mother would fill the plate with rice and dal, he would feed us and he would eat himself. If any rice is left or dal is left, he's never thrown away. My mother would top up the rice and top up the dal and she will eat from the same plate. And she will never eat in front of us. Tradition is such that the Indian woman will never eat food in front of the male members of the family. So she used to go to a corner of the house against the wall and sit down and eat. It's considered politeness. So your father actually feeds you as yeah, he eats. When we're... So you see, that is the experience of one family. Now, this is not the case in every family. I, I must make it very clear. Even if you go to another Bochburi speaking family, it may be a very different situation. So people, you know, uh, kind of like follow traditions in different degrees. So this is not by no means the only way that family relationships are maintained. Now, as I mentioned, um, marriages were arranged. 
Now, when marriages were reached, the parents would consult an astrologer and they will match the horoscopes, boy and girl. Now, uh, all the indicators, they have, a, they, they have a row of indicators and all indicators, or at least most of the major indicators must meet, must match, if not no marriage. And then an auspicious time will be fixed for the, to, for the marriage, a time and so on. And not only that, in some communities, they even go to the extent of fixing the time where the marriage is consumed, you know, consummated, I mean, okay? And the marriage is consummated. So they even fix that time. And bridal leaves are discussed early on. And I mentioned why Indian families uh, love to accumulate gold jewelry because they make good bridal gifts. Now, because communities are small and everybody wants to show that they are doing well, there's a lot of social pressure for grand weddings. So sometimes families stretch themselves to, to kind of, you know, do their best, you know, because it's a reflection of their family's reputation and their prestige. And uh, romantic relationships are definitely more. Now, if you're wondering who is this gentleman up here, he is actually Mr. Iqbal. Mr. Iqbal is a poet, a man you would grow to like the minute you meet him. Within the next three minutes, you will grow to like him. Such a wonderful man. He's a very big heart. Now, when Mr. Iqbal, Mr. Iqbal is an Indian Muslim. In his younger days, when he was a teenager, he actually loved someone. He fell in love with a girl who, who is from a more well-off family than he is. And, um, you know, although they loved each other, they have never spoken a word to each other. Would you believe that they have never spoken a word to each other? If you think that COVID-19 social distancing is bad, they maintain even a greater distance. They stayed far away from each other. They never spoke to each other. But how do you think that they, 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 they kind of connected? It is with their eyes. So you see, have you seen an Indian dance before? You know, the many movements a dancer makes to communicate an emotion. So yes, Indians are good at it. So we can look at the, our eyes. So what happened was eventually, um, the girl got married to someone else. And Mr. Iqbal being a poet, during when he was in love with her, he wrote many poems, you know, about his feelings for her. So once she was married, being the gentleman he is, he discarded all the poetry because now she's somebody's wife. So he forgot all about her, he moved on with life. Years later, he got married. Then he had his own, he had his own children. They grew up, he became a grandfather. And when they were grandparents, of course, he told his wife that he loved someone, you know. One day he came back home and this lady whom he loved when he was a teenager, decades ago, was in his house and she was having tea with his wife. And he was like shocked. And uh, of course, you know, they were civil to each other. She drank tea, she had a few chat, little chat, and probably the first time they ever chatted in the entire life. <laughs> then after that, she left. Do you know what happened? Three months later, she passed away. Now, these are the kind of stories that you will get in, when you listen to all these stories. They will touch your soul. They will touch your heart. Okay? Now, uh, now let's look at the next part of, of, of the girl's life. Now enough of romance and love and tears, you know. The thing is that oral history will always bring a smile on your face, sometimes it brings a tear to your eyes or sometimes even make you angry, but it will never fail to arouse your emotions. That's the strength of oral history. Now, after marriage, the bride will enter the husband's family in a very subordinated, subordinated position to the mother-in-law. So the mother-in-law is actually the law. Okay, and if their elder sister-in-laws or you know they will behave like as though they were the deputy mother-in-laws or assistant mother-in-laws, everybody will boss over the young poor daughter-in-law. So husbands are usually caught in between their mothers, you know, between their mothers and sisters, you know, and manage that that relationship. Why this way? First, those days women don't work, so when the daughter-in-laws move into a into a new house, you know, into their, into their, their in-laws family, they are financially dependent on that family because the husband is the one who brings the money and usually the money goes to the mother-in-law and she will, the mother-in-law is usually the matriarch, she manages the family. And so, you know, there's a lot of dependence and there's also a lot of social pressure on the young brides to conduct themselves as good daughter-in-laws, you know, to get along with their mother-in-law. 
So even if they are bullied or ill treated in some situations, they will just tahan lah. They will carry on. You know, they will stay. And the her relationship in the in-laws house affects her family relation, her reputation of her own parents' family. Which means, if let's say a daughter-in-law has a lot of problems and she decides to go back to the parents' house, the parents will persuade her to go back. I said, please go back. Try to get along with your mother-in-law. It's okay. She's an elder lady. Try to understand. That's how they will pacify and send her back. But nobody will say that, look, I know they're treating you badly. Come to my house. Because it affects the reputation of the family. And the other thing is that if one of the daughters comes back home, it could even jeopardize the marriage opportunities for her sisters. Because say that hey, something is wrong with the way this family raised your daughter. That kind of feeling. So parents are again trapped, you know, rights are trapped. So it's, it's, it's a very, very funny situation. Now, the position of widows even, is even worse. In those days, people used to get married early, very early. And if somebody is widowed at a very young age, she will never get remarried. She will never marry again. And she will wear a white sari. She cannot put on flowers and the red dot that married Indian ladies. But these are considered as as, as good things, as, as, as happy things, as something that a married lady will have. But she is not allowed to have any one of these. She is socially isolated. She lives, she lives a socially isolated life for the rest of her life. Right? Now, that's why a lot of Indian ladies actually pray for their husband's well-being. They have special rituals and special prayers where they pray for the longevity of their husbands. Why? Because their well-being is very linked, intertwined with the well-being of their husbands. No, but this is not always the case. No, that where, where you know, daughter-in-laws get bullied and so on. I mean, Mrs. Dolly Sinha Devanpot, she's a Bengali. And uh, she married into a prominent Bengali family in Singapore. Her father-in-law, her husband, but both were gynecologists. So they are very well off family. And Dolly is actually in, was in India. So they went to India, got their son married to Dolly. And when Dolly came to Singapore, it was a more welcoming situation. The family embraced her, treated her like as their own daughter. And they, you know, they helped her in very unusual ways to settle into a different environment. If you're an Indian, you probably eat with your fingers. You know, our Indian food is designed to be eaten with our fingers. If you are a bit atas, you will eat with a fork and spoon. Okay? Now, but chopstick is something that's alien. But if you're in Singapore, you know, you have Chinese friends, you have to go for dinner. I mean, you know, you need to know. So her parents, her, her, her parents-in-law actually get her, you know, mushrooms and a chopstick to practice. So every day she, she practiced picking up wet, you know, smooth mushrooms in order to perfect her skills in, skills in using a, 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 a chopstick. And not only that, they even, you know, because she's away from her family, they organize recreational activities for her, like get her to learn flower arrangements, uh, get her to do pottery. And, you know, interestingly, after that, she even went to do her law degree. So even she continued with education, Dolly was actually a botanist by training, but after her marriage, she became a lawyer. You know, isn't that amazing? I mean, you know, even in a, in a, in a very conservative times, families treated some of their daughter-in-laws very, very differently. And Dolly was also encouraged by her family to, to get involved in social activities. And she was the pioneer member of the Asian Women's Welfare Association. As you know, a lot of thousands of people benefit from the work of this association. And she was one of the pioneer members uh, who started this association. And she also became the president of the Bengali Association of Singapore. Not bad, right? For a lady, you know, in, in, in a time where most families were conservative, you know, your in-laws were so good to you. Now, that's not the only one. Then you look at another family. Now, you must have heard about constitutions. Countries having constitutions. Associations having constitutions. How? Have you heard about a family constitution? Mr. Shabir Hassan Bai's family had a family constitution. Now, Mr. Shabir Hassan Bai is of Gujarati origin. He is a Gujarati Muslim. A perfect gentleman. And his father had the foresight to come up with a one-page family constitution. Just listen to this clip. Uh, which my father was very far-sighted to articulate in a simple one-page 
A4 size. Uh, what are the things we as a family business should follow? So this is what they call a family constitution. Very simply uh, articulated and with an example. Besides this, these three values, net worth, life worth, have family meetings. He always felt the family must gather around. But not family meetings means only the men. That means you sit down with your wives. Because if your wife doesn't know what you are doing, you are going to get into trouble. So it's better to include your wives in important decision-making processes. So have family meetings with wives. Second most important thing in the Constitution and the values you put down for the family was please have a holiday. Every year, every member of the family, that is the boys, must go and have a break from the family, or from the work, to refresh yourself. It says you can't work till you drop dead. You are going to drop dead one of these days, but you should enjoy life. You see, very, very interesting, very interesting idea. Not only that, there's one more point. He also stated in the constitution, it was stated in the family constitution that if they want to work together, they shouldn't live together. You know, before, and there was a time when Mr. Shabir and his brothers and family lived in one house, but they had a family business. So the father said that, look, if you guys want to work together, you want to be in a family business, please live separately. Because when you live together, invariably, the pressures and the differences in opinions in the office will drift into the home and will drift into the dinner table. So they don't, he, did it, he didn't want any of those things. So he said, if you work together, if you want to work together, don't live together. And the other thing about life worth and net worth, life worth is the emphasis on trust. Even when you don't have money, people respect you, people trust you. That is life worth. That is more than money. Net worth is, of course, you know how much money you have. So that's the difference between life worth and net worth. And this is very clearly defined in Mr. Shabir's oral history interview recordings. And you look at this family, they're having oral history, I mean, sorry, they're having family meetings. And the, the father insists the daughter in laws sit in this meeting. So it doesn't look like the daughter in laws are in any subordinate position. It seems that they were accorded a lot of respect in this family. And, I, I, and I'm really impressed with these ideas about you know, annual holidays, in fact, and about ideas about retirement. And there's also another clause which says that who can be involved in the family business so that the harmony is maintained in the company. So if you look, if you, if you have the opportunity, this recording is not online yet. We will be putting it up within the next two weeks. So look out for this, this recording. Here you will also get to hear some of the adventures of Mr. Shabir because he was a timber merchant at one time, you know, previously. And he went to the jungles of East Malaysia and Africa. So, you know, you will hear lots of adventures, even, you know, life-threatening moments. So, a really exciting interview. Look out for it. It should be there within the next two weeks. Uh, with my father. Okay. Now, let's look at another part, the education of daughters. So, in this equation, you realize that the ultimate goal of a parent, ultimate objective of a parent is to get the daughter married. So, education was not considered so important for their daughters. Now, Mrs. Kripalko, Mrs. Kripalko is a Punjabi Sikh. Her father migrated from Punjab to join the police force in Singapore. He was in the police band, and the family lived in the police quarters together with many Punjabi families. And a lot of the girls in those families, they never went beyond primary education. And, but, Madam Kripalko's father, he had greater foresight, he didn't want to follow the rest. He was a man of himself. He said, no, my daughter will get educated. And he was supported by the father. So the father was ahead of time. Have a listen to this. My father actually was very firm about me going to school because uh, I was the eldest daughter. And I uh, had so many brothers, but I was the eldest daughter. And uh, he had no sisters. He, there were no, his, his father had no sisters. So. Being the first girl in the family, I think they had different visions of me. 
And he said, no, uh, she must be educated. She must be able to write. And he was proud of the fact that I passed my PSLE when no other girl in the band had passed. So I, I did uh, go on. Uh, things didn't change when I was still in the secondary school, but when I started working, things didn't change very much. But I think later when I became a qualified teacher, the glamour of the job took people by surprise. The, you see, again, because I was educated in a girls' school, where in Cedar Girls Secondary School, we were also trained to be young ladies, you know, how to walk, how to move, how to sit. So together with my education, together with a little bit of training in the teacher's training college, uh, I was given a second look, I must say. Uh, and I think the glamour of, you know, Bhagwan Singh's daughter is a teacher, and look at her going to school with a handbag and her books and so on, became the glamour part of it. Uh, so, so we just accepted it uh, and worked on. But although all this was said and done, the other one thing was that it was a good thing I was working because the year I started working, my father retired from the police force. And uh, so, of course, that monthly salary is not coming in. My elder brother was still on the, in the university as uh, he was on a scholarship and the, and the younger siblings were schooling. So my salary that came in was very, very helpful. And uh, so that also put a lot of questions in people's mind, should girls work or not? You know, and I'm so very glad that it was my family that put things right there. And I also know that in many families, uh, girls of my age in that family didn't go to school. But after me, the younger ones, the parents insisted on sending them to school as well. So it was a bit of an achievement, I must say, because... Uh, People realized and people saw that uh, there is somebody's daughter who is quite good in the home, but she's also, you know, doing this and doing that. I think our daughters can do the same. I am glad in many ways that we did set a trend. And that is thanks to my father and to my brother, who was a scholar himself and who was a very forward-looking uh, person. Thanks. Thanks to a very... Uh, forward-looking father and brother, uh, Singapore had one more good educator and the Punjabi community had one capable community leader. Um, next, let's look at another family. Here we are looking at the family of Mrs. Vijayam Sharma. Mrs. Sharma is a Tamil from the Tamil community. She is a Tamil Brahmin and she's a retired school principal and an Indian classical music guru. Now, Interesting, you know, what she mentioned during the interview was that now we are, Mrs. Sharma is in the 80s now. Mrs. Sharma is this lady over here. And this beautiful lady over here is our volunteer, Ms. Premalata Naidu. And uh, Mrs. Sharma shared that during her, uh, you know, her mother, if she's in the 80s, her mother must be a lot older, right? In those days, when her mother came into her grandparents' family as a new daughter-in-law, the family knew that the mother had a musical background. They sent the mother for further musical training after she came into the family. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? In the sense that, you know, your daughter-in-law comes into your family, you know she's got an interest in music, and she's given further music training. And the mother was apparently a very determined lady who learned English by reading the newspapers and attending their classes. So she had a lot of support from her in-laws but also with musical background. So it's a very different kind of setting. And the other thing is that Mrs. Sharma, her four sisters and brother were all educators, they were all in the education field. Mrs. Sharma, I mean, decided to start work after all levels because of financial constraints, but two of her, uh, her siblings went on to do a degree. And all their family members, all her brothers and sisters were into music and into dance and they were active in the arts field. No. You look at this family, they are very, very progressive. Okay? They are very, very progressive and in terms of educating their daughters. But they were traditional at the same time. You know, below are all the festivals that were celebrated by this family. Now, in Mr. Sharma's interview, she actually listed all these festivals, the significance of each of these festivals, what food is prepared, the recipe for some of this, this food, and the gods that they worship during this, uh, you know, for these festivals. And, and a lot of these festivals are also, you know, meant for the well-being of the family and well-being of the husband. 
So it's interesting in the sense that in this family, a very progressive, progressive thoughts as well as tradition coexisted together. You know, that's a very interesting part of this family. Now let's reflect on all these families that we've heard so far. Now some tend to be very conservative, some tend to be more progressive, and some tend to be, you know, super supportive. Now, could there be factors that influence these different experiences? Now we have to ask ourselves. I mean, we can't come to any conclusions on the basis of just a few families, but just some food for thought. If you look at it, I think it also depends on the education of parents. See, Mr. Shabir Hazanzbai's father is educated. Mr. Sharma's father was a school teacher who later became a clerk. And, and so is um, Dolly Sinha's in-laws. They were educated people. So did education make that difference that made people more welcoming? We leave that question open. Second, whether they are first generation or established family in Singapore. In the case of, of Mrs. Madam Kripalko, they were first generation. First generation normally come in with some of their value systems from India. But if you look at Mrs. Sharma's family, she was third generation. And her parents were educated. And for Mr. Shabir Azanbai, he's also third generation. Now, third generation means they would have had different kind of exposure. They would have been exposed to other communities. There's a strong possibility that they have been exposed to other communities in Singapore. They have a broader, broader, uh, sorry, a broader horizon. And third, socioeconomic status. Now, if you look at uh, Dolly's in-laws, they are very affluent. They are well connected with the who's, who's who in Singapore. And you know, they attend all these social functions. So their attitude is very different. So even in one period, the people with different backgrounds treated their family members differently. But like I say, these cannot be generalizations. These are all unique to these families. But you know, I think it is good to just try to understand what could have brought about these changes. Now, what changed everything? Now, this is the part. First, thanks to Singapore's public housing programs, you know, all the enclaves were broken. People were resettled all over Singapore. They were dispersed. So you don't have your, your, your village, you know, someone who is from your same village, staring, overlooking into your family, looking at what's happening in your family. So everybody moved away. So the pressure is gone. You know, you feel unshackled. Now you're in a different environment. There are so many different people living around you. So that's first. Second is education. Now, with more education, when Indian women, when Indian girls went to school and they got educated, they opened up, you know, they realized that, you know, why are we living, you know, why should we be like this? And with exposure came more confidence, you know, they became more self-confident and they became financially more independent when they, when they finished their studies, they were able to earn their money. So when you have money in your handbag on your purse, I think you feel more confident, you feel more important, more accomplished. So you no longer have to listen to people, you don't have to press about it. You know the kind of self-confidence one gets? Now, economic development, even for, you see in the 1970s, you know, Singapore was fast industrializing. There were a lot of factories in Singapore that provided jobs for low-skill production operators. So even girls who didn't have much education were able to find jobs. So when they went to work, again, the same feeling. I'm no longer dependent. I have money. I'm capable. I can make my own. So it, it brought about a new sense of freedom that there's no longer this financial dependence. And when people moved out to study, went to work, they meet other people. And you, fell, and, you, and, and, and you fall in love, and you fell in love. You know, so there were more love marriages. So slowly, the caste conscious started disappearing. And then when you are in love, you don't necessarily ask someone, excuse me, what was your grandfather's profession? Was he a cobbler? No, you won't. You say, look, you look at the person. I mean, she's beautiful. She's nice. She's so sweet. You know, I can get along well with her. We have common interests. That's more important. Who cares? You know, that's a kind of feeling, but not in all situations, but you know, I'm just, you know, that's a possibility. And, you know, the Indians, despite the modernizing and all, we still have our life cycle ceremonies. Now we have many ceremonies from the time a mother 
uh, from marriage and you know we, we, we are up to marriage now the mother has is pregnant and there are ceremonies around the 78 months special ceremonies to 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 kind of like pray for the mom and the, for a good childbirth and there are naming ceremonies and um I don't know whether you have been, if you have not been to an Indian wedding, you should try to get yourself invited to one. These are really, really very colorful, full of rituals, full of music, full of sound. I think you should go and take a look. And our funerals are also elaborate. So we have all these life cycle ceremonies and these things we are continuing. And um, the priest, this continuity, you see there was a time there was some concern that, you know, would people forget about all this? But again, the priests who conduct these ceremonies, they provide some continuity. And they also some community elders who can guide. And you have the wedding planners who have taught themselves how to do all these ceremonies. And you have funeral service operators. So there's some continuity for to all this. Now, if you don't know, if you still need help, please go onto the internet. There's lots of information there, you know, if you want to cross-reference things. But some of these ceremonies have been modified, you know, have been shortened. So then, wedding proceedings have been shortened and um, you know even for funerals you know in the olden days um, especially for Hindu ceremonies the sons will have to shave their head as part of the, the funeral ceremony, uh, uh, proceedings but these days they don't do that and uh, in the olden days women are not allowed to go to the crematorium but nowadays you know increasingly more women are also going to curate so crematoriums to pay their respects to the deceased person. So there are certain changes. So I asked, you know, um, Ram and Dolly, whether there were, you know, still any caste elements practiced in all this. So they said, there's such a thing called Brahmin Bhoja. That means uh, when a person dies, the Brahmins are given a meal. The first meal goes to the Brahmins. And the more Brahmins were fed, then, the deceased person's spirit get more credit points. So in Ram's case, his brother is not a Brahmin. So usually he'll go late so that he don't he can eat with his brother. Because after the Brahmin bhojan is over, then they call it a Shaka Bhoj. That means everybody sits down and eats. So he wants to eat with his brother in law. So he goes later. So this is one element that has been pointed out by both by Dolly as well as Ram. Now let's look back a little bit okay now the the generation the current generation is no longer shackled by the controls that shape the family relations of the pre medeka and pioneer generation it's no longer there now the focus has also shifted from what is good for the family prestige to what is good for the children you know and this is more decision making power has moved to the children so today the children decide in most situations who they want to marry, you know, and what jobs they want to do, what kind of education they want to have. So there's a shift, you know, in, in, in the power structure within the family. And gender relationships have become more balanced because both your sons and daughters can have an education. They both have their careers, so there's no imbalance. They are both independent. Now, uh, life cycle ceremonies, rituals are still being observed, but there are some mod modifications. Now, the younger generation of Singaporean Indians are growing up in a national and global level. So, in one generation, everything has changed. Okay. Now, let me touch on Indian families. So, in Indian businesses, in the interest of time, I'll just confine myself to just one business. Okay, because we, we're running a bit of time. Ben is staring at me. Okay, now let's look. You know, I mentioned about Indian jewelry earlier on. No? Now, Indian jewelry is treated, is traditionally handmade by goldsmith. They belong to a color clan called Patars. This is in Tamil Nadu, South India. Now, they, it's a design and make model. That means a Patar will design the jewelry for you and you'll make it. And he will have drawings. He will draw, design, and make. It is individually handcrafted. Okay. Now in Singapore, the business practice was for partners to. They took orders directly from customers. Like, say, if your mom wants to make a piece of jewelry, she go to the partner. They will, you know, look at the drawing and they will design. And they will also fulfill orders for the jewelry stores, largely in Serangoon Road, and some subcontract jobs from other partners. Now, apart from just making jewelry. They also, they also specialize in 
ear piercing and nose piercing. These days you go to a doctor to get such things done, but those or, or, or somewhere, but those days it is done by the goldsmith. <clears throat> Pretty painful affairs. So, according to Mr. Paranipan, who is actually a jeweler, in the 1950s and 60s, there were about 400 patters operating in the Shrangan Radio area. Very individual craftsmen, individually designed uh, jewelry, and they went in business. And they were also operating in places with a huge concentration of Indians like Chani, Tanjabaga, Chalankayu, Sambawang, and so on. So, you know, there are a huge number of partners were operating in Singapore in the 50s and 60s. By the 90s, they were reduced to 10. Now, you can't find a partner around. What happened? How did, how did a group of people whose ancestors have been dealing, you know, who have been goldsmith, suddenly are no longer around? Because of disruption, business disruption. It started with the introduction of machine-made jewelry because the Chinese jewelers introduced machine-made jewelry now, which is faster to make, cheaper to make than, you know, individual, individually crafted uh, jewelry. And it also allowed for mass customization. So much so that, you know, even the Indian jewelry stores started buying from the Chinese makers. So the partners couldn't handle this disruption because for hundreds of years, they have operated their way. They have operated as, as individual craftsmen, not as a business, you know, like in a, in a group like that. So they couldn't take the disruption. Neither were they wealthy enough to adopt this, this technology. So a lot of them retreated back and tried to focus on specific jewelry, which is linked to certain Hindu marriages, like example, the Thali or the Mangal suit or, or, or Trimangalian. You know, these are things that Indian um, brides, you know, wear on the wedding and they wear it for the rest of their life. So this is uniquely crafted. They go in there, but they still couldn't manage. And eventually the whole thing changed. And the business did not stop there, but the business kept evolving. Now, in 1992, there were just about 10 jewelry stores in Strangon Road. And they all had a regular clientele. Every family had, is connected to a particular jewelry store because, you know, they feel that I must buy jewelry from this shop because it's very lucky, you know what I mean? So if my daughter's wedding, I'll buy from there, you know, so that, that sort of a thing. But today, there are 60 jewelry stores, including large foreign chains in Singapore. The competition has become intensive and jewelry is no longer made in Singapore. You know, the patterns from individually crafted jewelry to mass customized machine made jewelry now is no longer made here. The jewelry is actually imported from India, from places like Tamil Nadu, from Calcutta, from Mumbai, and even Dubai. So the whole business has changed, you know, completely. And um, with that, I think we, we have almost reached one hour. So I think Ben is, winning, is getting very upset with me. So I will end my talk here. Thank you for your patience. And we can look at questions now. Hi Raj, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Okay, we have uh, a few questions. Okay, the, so I will, I will feel the first one. Uh, the first uh, one is uh, uh, Chitra Prasad. Uh, so she asked that uh, there are some insights from the younger generation can throw more lights into the changes. So does the oral history center uh, interview uh, members from the younger generation? Um, usually the practice is that when we interview someone, or at least a current practice, is usually to interview someone who is in the older age group. So you get a range of experiences over a broad perspective because, you know, within a person's lifetime, they go through different cycles, different changes. So most of the interviewees are usually in the older age group. Um, we only interview people in the younger age group where there are certain episodes. Like for example, today and now we have a COVID-19 situation. So we may choose to you know, interview people who are younger, who have, got, who have experienced certain things there. But usually the practice is to interview older people. So that they can give a broad perspective, they can share a range of experiences over their lifetime and how things changed over a lifetime. The younger person would, all, would probably give what is current today. Thanks, Raj. 
Okay, so uh, okay, we are running very short on time, but we do have a few more questions. So another question from uh, Prasanna Nae. So do you think uh, the cast is still a major consideration in Indian marriages today? Uh, will it be the same for the different Indian groups? I think that the caste system is a relic of the past. Now, when people moved from India to Singapore, they came with this particular practice. But it is very inconsistent with the way our younger generation is raised. Now, we, the younger generation, and probably the, and the Madeka generation, we grew up at a time where, you know, Singapore, in multiracial Singapore, multi-religious Singapore, where we learn to live harmoniously with other people, and we learn to respect each other. And we also believe in meritocracy. We always is a meritocratic system. So in such a system, we are programmed very differently from the practices of what of the caste system, which is which is very fixated. How is this more? You know, it's a more progressive system, it's more dynamic. So the question is if let's say when two people are falling in love, they will fall in love and they get they want to get married, it will be for a different reason. So, like I mentioned during the talk, the ancestors' profession or the grandfather's profession means doesn't doesn't mean much to them they would marry someone who they feel they are compatible with they have common interest with for character matching and so on so again in these situations actually the caste is quite relevant but i wouldn't say that it is completely that that all families don't look at i mean all families do not look at uh, the situation like this there could be some families for their own reasons would prefer to say that I would like to get my child married to someone within my own caste group. But that's a private matter. But by and large, I think that caste is no longer a factor for marriage. Thanks, Raj. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. So we do have a lot of questions. So I apologize ahead if we can't answer all of them. So maybe I just squeeze time for just one last question. Um, this question is from uh, Mr. Achana. So what were the adjustment from living with your community uh, in the villages and to living with other communities after the public housing program was introduced? Sorry, can you repeat that question? So, so how was the adjustment from living in the villages to living with other communities in the public housing program was introduced? How was the adjustment like? You see, I would imagine that the initial adjustment must have been quite difficult. Uh, in the sense that, you know, you, you have um, all your relatives living around you. Everybody is like, you know, just, um, you know, you, 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 you could, what you call as, um, you know, you need help. You can just go next door because your relative is living next door. So, but suddenly, you, initially, you might have felt that, look, you know, I'm away from my relatives. There could be a sense of loneliness. And those days, people live in kampongs, you know, on the ground. So, you know, everybody, it's quite common in the evenings for people to step out of their house and have tea and chat, or, you know, for children to play outside, for children to play outside their homes. But when you move to a HDU flat, it's a very different situation. I mean, you know, you're very much confined to your flat. And, um, you know, so you, 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 you might have felt a sense of loss, you know, that, that, that personal touch with your relatives, they're no longer near. But... I think over time, people adjust, people get used to it. And then after that, you know, you, you slowly realize that you are no longer subject to the same kind of pressure when you are living together with your village members. Okay, thanks Raj. Okay, so we are already uh, past seven. So we have come uh, to the end of the talk. So, so sorry that uh, we have a lot of questions that uh, we can't answer because of time. Okay, so so now we have come to the feedback time. So, Ben, can I say something? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, whatever I've said is based on just three years of exposure to oral history. So I would apologize to anyone if I got anything wrong. And, um, you know, please, I'm just someone who's curious and who's still learning. So give me that chance to grow and learn. And thank you very much for attending my talk.